the beginning of the Christmas story. During the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abdibajah. His wife Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron. They were both righteous before God, blameless in their observance of all the Lord's commands and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to become pregnant and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving as a priest before God because his priestly division was on duty. Following the customs of priestly service, he was chosen by lottery to go into the Lord's sanctuary and burn incense. All the people who gathered to worship were praying outside during this hour of incense offering. An angel from the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and overcome with fear. The angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to your son, and you must name him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many people will, will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the Lord's eyes. He will not drink wine and liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even before his birth. He will bring many Israelites back to the Lord their God. He will go forth before the Lord, equipped with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of fathers back to their children, and he will turn the disobedient to righteous patterns of thinking. He will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure of this? My wife and I are both very old. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news to you. Know this, what I have spoken will come true at the proper time. But because you didn't believe, you will be made silent, unable to speak until the day when these things happen. <coughs> For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God in us, we say, thanks be to God.
Anybody over here? What are you hoping for? More shaving cream. More shaving cream. <laughs> <laughs> what? A spy drone? Oh my goodness. That sounds like trouble. <laughs> what are you hoping for? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Of course. <laughs> I should have known. Chloe? You don't know yet? They are. I didn't they realize they that. Cool. <laughs> You're going to teach a class someday, Jackson, on dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm going to come. Let's set it up. Yeah. What are you hoping for, Teddy? He told 
all of Israel that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Savior of the people. And so he pointed the way. He prepared the way for, for Jesus to come. And so he was, he was their hope. They had given up on hope. And he gave us all hope by pointing out that Jesus was here with us. John wasn't one of the disciples, but he was what we would call a prophet. He spoke a message from God for everyone to hear, that Jesus was the Messiah. So today we're going to light the candle of hope. Is there anybody who wants to do that? Oh, I saw Chloe first. Let me go get the... Let me see, can I reach?
So help us not to give up hope and to trust you and to remember the hope that Jesus is bringing us this month. We pray your blessing on these children, that you would keep them safe and bring them back next week to keep learning about you. And all of God's children said, Amen. My name is Nancy, and I'm the staff musician here. What that means is that I get paid in part for the professional services that I offer as a musician. I'm not just somebody who likes to sing. I have a degree in music and a lifetime of professional experience. That's how I came here. I, I didn't come here seeking a church home. I came to fill a job opening for someone to play the hymns. That was about 20 years ago. I've been a Methodist my whole life, but for many years I had no interest in becoming a member here as my personal spiritual life was going in some very different directions. Then this one showed up. <laughs> Very clear to me immediately that the creator of the entire universe sent her to us. So several years ago, I did become a member. When you become a member, then there's the whole presence, gift, service thing. So I had to think about that. Because my pay here never increased as the amount of work more than doubled over the years. Now, it's long before Pastor Corey even got here. It's about half of what would be paid at other churches for what I do. And then I provide my own equipment, laptop, iPad, digital keyboards, etc., to do the job. And then when expenses come up, like new music for the choir, I usually just cover them. Plus, like many of you, I spend a considerable amount donating to special causes and food for dinners and whatnot. I have always considered all of that my financial donation to the church. In my whole life, I have never pledged an amount of money to a church. But this year, I'm going to. I'll continue to do all the stuff I do and pay for the stuff I've always paid for, but I'm also going to pledge an amount of money for 2019. Now, why am I telling you all this very uncomfortable, personal stuff that is nobody's business and that I would normally never talk about in public? Because this church, this community, needs all of us to do that. We need to be able to talk about our money in order to be able to budget. The services we provide to the community have expanded so much. Activity here and good use of the building has increased so much that we have not been able to keep up with expenses. Everybody needs to know that and be aware, we're tapped out. We cannot take on one more good project or deal with an emergency. We have not been paying in enough to cover what we're doing. It's really important that everybody understands this. It's a healthy problem. We're doing a lot more of what we should be doing. We're just falling short of paying for it. To help get this all back in balance, we have those papers to fill out. And filling out these papers will help the people in charge of creating the budget for 2019 have an idea of what they're going to have to work with. We haven't done that in the past. Maybe you can't give any more than you have been giving, but maybe if you give it some prayerful thought, maybe you can. But either way, we all need to write down what we plan to give and let people know so we will know whether or not we have to cut back on some of what we've been doing or can we, in fact, continue this amount of service and we pay our bills. Together, we've got to put our money where our mouth is, put our money where our hearts are, and be willing to communicate about it. So this paper, if you haven't done this already, please put this someplace where you're going to run into it when you get home. Make this a priority. Make this a great thing you're going to do for yourself, your church, your community, and your relationship with spirit in 2019. Thanks. I'd ask you now to please pray for me as I pray for you. Let us pray.
O oh, source of our hope, make your truth known to us today and forever, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, back in July, we began a year-long focus on walking the walk. We agreed we would use our time together on Sundays to figure out how to follow Jesus more closely, to identify the ways we could live more fully as followers of the way of Christ. And so we started in the summer watching popular movies, as we've done for many years, and practicing finding God's truth in these seemingly secular films. And then after practicing looking for God everywhere, we told each other about the things we've seen and experienced. We shared our Holy Ghost stories with one another. And that is kind of the preliminary work. We noticed God and we talked about what we've noticed with each other. But now, then we wanted to really start following Jesus which usually starts out great, of course, until you hit a roadblock of some kind. So just recently we spent time exploring the things, or thing, really, that holds us back, which of course is fear. We work to understand the root of our fears and practice releasing our fears to God through faith. So we saw God, we talked about what we saw together, shared. We started to try to get rid of some of the stuff, the fear that holds us back. And now, church, it's time to say yes. We're told Zachariah and Elizabeth were faithful, righteous followers of God. They had said yes to following God's way. They were all in. Zachariah served as a volunteer assistant priest around the temple, and Elizabeth ordered their home around every kosher law, and likely keeping upbeat and cheerful despite the fact that probably both of them felt a tinge of failure, maybe, or at least sadness. Of course, they never had any children. And back then, especially, the assumption was that you just would, and if you couldn't, a couple who didn't have children, well, they were probably cursed or something. They, they must have done something wrong. But the fervent prayers for a child, for Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were long past. They were old and had began to reconcile themselves to a childless life. It was fine. They were busy helping neighbors, serving in the temple. And this is where Luke's story picks up with them on quite a big day. Zechariah had won the lottery. Well, the priest lottery. He was the priest chosen to burn the incense offering. He'd done this a few times before, probably, but it was always a gift to be granted access into the inner sanctuary of the temple. Not many people were even allowed to go in there. So Elizabeth made sure he had a hearty breakfast that morning and gotten their nicest robes ready the night before. And as Zachariah made his way to the temple, he might have wondered if this would be the last time for him that he would serve at the Lord's temple, at the altar. Perhaps that's why his name was picked this day, so he could make one last offering himself in the holiest of holies. Of course, he could have never imagined the real reason his name was chosen that day. When he entered the inner sanctuary of the temple, there was an angel there waiting for him. I would think he probably thought, well, this is it. God's coming, taking me home. But instead, the angel gave him some of the most surprising and wonderful news he had ever heard. Elizabeth was going to have a baby. 
after all these years. The way angel went on with all these instructions that they were to name him John, and he was going to be a righteous man who would lead his people back to God. But that wasn't it. Not only was Zechariah finally going to be a father, his son was going to be the herald of the Messiah, God's long-promised Savior of the people was coming to end their oppression. And his own son would be the one to prepare the way for the Christ. This was the kind of thing you would only believe if an angel was the one to tell you this information. And even then, of course, it was hard to believe. He and Elizabeth had hoped for so long they actually had given up hope on ever having a child. And then along comes an angel with a message beyond their wildest dreams. You know, you know I feel for Zachariah. Of course he would question it. Of course he would want to know how he could be sure this was going to happen. Years of disappointment and heartache I'm sure made it hard to accept this angel's message of hope. Hope takes some risk, which is hard to muster after years of being let down. Hope today is probably a gift that's hard to give away. We look around and most things seem pretty hopeless. Hope is a hard thing to accept when we watch the current news cycle, when we see our West Coast in ashes, our southern states still recovering from hurricanes. And earlier this week, as I watched tear gas bombs rain down on children and families, whose only chance at survival was to walk hundreds of miles just to be met with more attacks. As I watched those news stories, I did not know how I was supposed to preach hope this Sunday. I don't know how to preach hope to that. But thankfully, the prophet Isaiah did. So many, many years ago, the prophet Isaiah gave God's message to his people. He said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a pitch dark land, light has dawned. You have made a great nation. You have increased its joy, O God. They rejoice before you with joy at the harvest, as those who divide plunder rejoice. As on the day of Midian, you shattered the yoke that burdened them, the staff on their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor, because every boot of the thundering warriors, every garment rolled in blood will be burned, fuel for the fire, for a child is born. A child is born to us. A son is given to us. And authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. For eons, people have walked through dark times. For centuries, our hope has been challenged. But it was right into our darkness that God came to 
be with us. The very fact that God would deem us worthy enough to leave heaven, inhabit one of our forms, just to bring us the gift of hope and peace and joy and love, the gift of redemption, well, that just astounds me. Even in all our broken awfulness, God still thinks we're worth saving. God isn't ashamed of us. God's not even ashamed to be one of us. Christ willingly becomes one of us to show us the way out of our mess. To show us there is still hope. And that, that is what gives me hope. A glimmer of hope. And church, I'll tell you if there's one thing I know, a glimmer is all we need, truly. We only need a glimpse of that Christ child to remember that not all hope is lost. We may have given up hope on some things, but Advent is a season meant to remind us that God has never given up hope on us. God has never given up hope and will never give up hope on us. God believes we are savable and sent Christ to do just that. The gift of Jesus that we receive, that gift is a vote of confidence in our world. It's a gift of hope for all of us. So the question is, are we ready to accept it? Can we say yes to hope today, in spite of it all? Are we willing to risk hoping, remembering that Christ risked it all? When I feel at times hopeless, I'm reminded that we can cling to God's hope for the world. When our hope is tapped out, we can remember that God, God still has hope for us. We can cling to that hope. But we also need to remember as we prepare in Advent, the thing we are preparing for has already come. So may we look for these signs of hope that are all throughout this world because this world has already welcomed the Christ. This world has already been saved. So may we embrace each little glimmer of hope that we see. And in doing that, we will be saying yes to God's gift of hope. We'll be unwrapping it and trying it on. And when we say yes to hope, we know that God will use us to bring some hope to the world. Amen. So I'll invite you to sing along with me to the tune of Hope, O Holy Night. <coughs> And your words will be the bolded words on the screens.
Thank you, God.